Hello and welcome to another lecture for my class on psychological testing and assessment. I feel like I haven't done this in a while, so I'm beginning with a comic from phdcomics.com, the excellent webcomic series. This one doesn't necessarily apply in a direct and obvious way to our lecture, but it expresses a sentiment that I'm pretty sure most graduate students and postdocs are, are familiar with. Anyway, today's lecture is called Introduction to Neuropsychology, as, as you can see, of course. And by way of an overview, what I'm going to try and do here is review some basic information, some things that you might have learned in previous classes if you've taken good biology or neurobiology especially classes, if you've taken a good biopsychology class, or maybe even if you've taken some really good abnormal psychology classes. That is to say, I'm going to review some of the basic structures and functions within the human nervous system from a very uh, microscopic and molecular level up through the more sort of macroscopic and, and sort of um, systems level. And the goal is to kind of connect as best as I can, different pieces of information here, some of which you maybe have already learned, to new ideas that are related to neuropsychological testing. So again, the important idea, or at least the important goal that I'm setting for myself, is I'm trying to review some concepts from basic neurobiology, maybe show you some stuff you already know and haven't thought about for a few years if you're not someone who regularly thinks about neurobiology, uh, maybe give you some new information, and again, especially connect that information to specific disorders or conditions, some of which are things or conditions that neuropsychologists routinely test for. So let's begin at kind of a microscopic, and you'll see in a few slides, kind of molecular level. Um, let's talk about some of the cells that make up the human nervous system. Here you can see an image from electron microscopy of some different um, neurons stained in green and also in red in the background. Neurons are the main cells in the nervous system. A quick note here, uh, nerves just refer to neurons that are outside of the central nervous system. Slight distinction there. Um, anyway, if we focus on the central nervous system, they're estimated to be between 100 and maybe upwards of 200 billion neurons in the brain. Um, most of these neurons have thousands of connections with other neurons, resulting in literally trillions of connections between all the different neurons just within your brain. Um, sensory neurons send signals from the sense organs into the sensory nervous system. Motor neurons send signals from the sensory nervous system out to muscles, glands, and organs. Interneurons carry signals within the central nervous system, and so on and so on. Uh, along with all these neurons doing their different jobs, we have glial cells which su provide support for the neurons. Glial comes from uh, the Latin word um, referring uh, neuroglia, uh, meaning nerve glue, and it essentially suggests that what glial cells do is they kind of connect and support uh, neurons and other uh, tissues in the nervous system. So here you can see another image from electron microscopy, and we've got a neuron here uh, stained in green, and you can get a sense of its really dense arboration, and you can see stained in red here uh, various glial cells which are providing support. So here you can see a kind of a rather generic image or diagram that you'd see probably in almost any neuroscience or neurobiology textbook of a neuron. Um, you can see the basic parts. There's the soma or body of the neuron. There are the dendrites, which are the areas of the neuron that can receive uh, signals from other neurons, the long projection of the axon, and the axonal terminal at the end, or terminals plural, where the uh, neuron can send out signals to other uh, neurons. You can also see here that a portion of the axon is surrounded, and as we'll discuss in future slides, um, electrochemically insulated by a sheath of myelin. Now if we pull out from this microscopic level to a more macroscopic level and look at what a brain looks like when it's sectioned into parts, we would notice that there are gray areas and white areas in the brain. Maybe you've seen this in real life if you've ever seen a dissected brain, or you've probably seen something like this in images, which you can of course easily find. Um, this gray matter of the brain reflects areas within the brain where there are concentrations of the cell bodies of the neuron, and the white matter reflects areas in the brain which are mostly 
insulated or myelinated axons. So you can see kind of there are these bands of area where most of the cell um, bodies of the neurons are, and these broad tracts where it's mostly projections of axons passing information uh, through the central nervous system. I'll get back to this idea of myelination and white matter in a couple more slides. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit back down at a microscopic level, at kind of a molecular level, about the electrochemical mechanics of nervous system transmission. So most neurons in your nervous system exist at a state of arresting potential, meaning that there is an electrochemical difference between the interior of the cell and the exterior of the cell. And this difference is often around negative 70 millivolts. Uh, the difference is achieved because of specific uh, pumps, sodium potassium pumps, that are distributed along the axons of the neuron. These pumps pump two sodium ions into the cell at the same time pumping three um, I'm sorry, pump two potassium ions into the cell at the same time pumping three sodium ions outside of the cell with the result that the cell becomes more negatively charged on the inside and more positively charged on the outside. And this separation of charges is essentially what a battery is, or is, is essentially how a battery works. We can think of all of our neurons as working like little batteries or having this little battery potential. Now this resting potential can be disrupted and can lead to an action potential under particular circumstances. When stimulation of a neuron causes a sudden depolarization and the cell becomes more positive briefly on the inside, um, this can trigger the activation of specific voltage-gated sodium channels, which then open up and allow a lot of sodium to rush into the cell and the cell becomes much more positive on the inside. Um, this uh, potential is eventually, count or this shift is eventually counteracted, and the cell then repolarizes and eventually goes back to its resting potential again. So again, you've probably seen an image or a diagram like this in a textbook for your biology or, or your neuroscience class. You can see here the resting potential of negative 70 millivolts uh, for a particular neuron. Imagine we've got like a little voltage clamp on the neuron and we're measuring that, that uh, potential difference between inside and outside of the cell. We watch um, over time there's stimulation and a sudden depolarization of the cell that is the action potential and then a period of time uh, of a refractory period where the cell repolarizes itself and then it's back to its regular resting state or its resting potential. Now what's interesting about this action potential is it allows the cell to make, in a sense, a simple decision. It can either fire or not fire an action potential. It has a sort of a binary decision point that it can make. Uh, this is sometimes likened to a gun firing. The gun's either not firing or it's firing. Um, by the way, as I'm recording this little video, I've got an animated GIF here that's showing a gun repeatedly firing. I'm curious to see when I record these down to an MP4 file if that movement will still exist. Anyway, how this might work, or how this typically works in the neuron, is that action potential propagates down the axon of the neuron, like a, like a wave of electrochemical shifting as different portions of the, um, of the axon go through the sudden depolarization and then repolarization as that, that wave kind of travels down. Uh, I mentioned myelin before. Myelin is this sort of uh, uh, fatty uh, lipid layers that kind of bundle up and go around the axons, and these act as insulation and particularly allow that action potential to, rather than sort of travel like a wave down the whole axon, as I described before, it actually kind of hopscotches to, in between the little gaps in the uh, pieces of nylon, uh, myelin, myelin uh, pieces called swan cells, and those little gaps called nodes of Ranvier, I suppose for someone named Ranvier who discovered them. But anyway, this is really important because it makes much more efficient the transmission of an action potential down the axon of a particular neuron. And here's a connection now to a disorder or a condition that neuropsychologists and other healthcare professionals might be concerned about, and that condition is multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis 
is a, uh, an autoimmune disorder that involves the body attacking its own nervous tissue, specifically destroying and, or degrading those myelin sheaths that exist around the axons of most healthy neurons. Uh, as a result of this, those neurons are less able to efficiently communicate with one another, and the result for the person who suffers from the disease can be a broad range of uh, debilitating signs and symptoms, you know, uh, blurred vision, headaches, uh, weakness in muscles, uh, trembling, etc. It can actually, um, you know, be uh, you know quite serious and and, uh, and dangerous to people. Um, interesting bit of history. It was first described way back in the 1800s by Jean Martin Charcot, who I know I've mentioned in previous lectures. So. For the purposes of this lecture, this is just one of those disorders which you've almost certainly heard about. You may know someone, a friend or a family member, who suffers from MS. It's not that uncommon a condition. And uh, now you know a little bit about the underlying pathology that is involved. Okay, so once an action potential is, trans, uh, is transmitted down the axon of a neuron, uh, ideally kind of hopscotching across the gaps between my, bits of myelin that are insulating that axon, it hits the synapse, and at that point, uh, it can stimulate the release of neurotransmitters from the axonal terminal of the neuron to the dendrite of some other neuron down the line. And the axon of the one neuron and the dendrite of the other are in almost all places in your nervous system separated by a very small gap called a synapse. Across that, neuro, uh, across that gap, uh, neurons can transmit chemical messengers that we call neurotransmitters, and depending on the nature of the neurotransmitter and the nature of the neuron uh, receptor, the neurotransmitter receptors on the dendrites of the downstream or postsynaptic neurons, those neurotransmitters can then trigger subsequent action potentials in other neurons. And so you can imagine each neuron has a kind of a, a decision-making quality. It can either fire an action potential or not based on the stimulation that it has received from neurons that are upstream from it. And then that neuron can transmit an action potential, trigger the release of neurotransmitters, which can downstream postsynaptically trigger action potentials in further neurons down the line. There are all sorts of different neurotransmitters. Um, I'll talk about a few of them just in a, a short slide or two. But we sometimes categorize them into two broad groups. They're the excitatory neurotransmitters, the ones which tend to um, increase the likelihood of an action potential in a postsynaptic neuron. And then, the, there are, then there are the inhibitory ones, which do the opposite. They tend to decrease the activity or the likelihood of an action potential in postsynaptic neurons. I said I would talk about some neurotransmitters. Uh, here's just an image that I took from a textbook that I use for a class that I teach on drugs. And um, it highlights a few of the neurotransmitters that you've probably heard of, things like acetylcholine and dopamine and norepinephrine and, and so on. Um, these neurotransmitters uh, are um, present in different parts of the nervous system, including the central nervous system. They tend to serve different roles depending on the parts of the brain that they're most prevalent in, and they um, can be disrupted by all sorts of activities, including drug use. So if we think about another kind of clinical phenomenon that you might encounter, or you might have personal experience with, um, that is drug intoxication or the acute effects of drugs, these can be described, at least in large part, uh, as disruptions of neurotransmitter activity. So if you take a drug like LSD, which causes a uh, very large release of um, serotonin in different parts of your brain, that explains at least partly why you get very sort of profound disruptions in the way the outside world is perceived. And if you take a drug like cocaine that causes, uh, uh, or that blocks reuptake or recycling of dopamine with the effect that dopamine tends to build up in different parts of your brain. Um, that explains, at least in part, why people have powerful surges of sort of um, excitement and craving when they're on cocaine. Okay, so that was a little bit about the kind of the microscopic and the molecular um, level of the neuro of the human nervous system. Um, again, not a very comprehensive look at that, but uh, the best I can do for one lecture. And it's stuff that you've probably already heard about, but it's hopefully a useful review for you. It may be an interesting review in so much as I try to connect it to some specific disorders or conditions that you've probably heard of. Now let's go back to a more macroscopic kind of structural level and look at another uh, look at another 
aspect or part of the nervous system. That is the cerebrospinal and vascular systems that support the human nervous system, especially the central nervous system and especially the brain. The cerebrospinal system is uh, the name we use to refer to the cerebrospinal ventricles and aqueducts that provide cerebrospinal fluid to the brain. This is a, a kind of a clear fluid that circulates through different pathways in the brain. Um, it provides some uh, nutritional and metabolic support for the brain, the nervous tissues in the brain. It also provides kind of um, a kind of a, a static support for the brain. It protects the brain from injury. You know, if you if you bump your head uh, suddenly, there's there's a reason why your brain doesn't splatter on the inside of your skull. It's that it is surrounded by this kind of um, these bags of water <laughs> that are the various uh, ducts and meninges that ink that hold cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, within the brain or kind of deep inside the, the brain itself, there are various ventricles. You can see um, them uh, noted in this diagram here. These are just interconnected chambers within the brain that produce and recycle cerebrospinal fluid. Um, it's not important right now that we memorize where all of them are, but just get a sense that there are these duct ways within the, the brain that supply um, cerebrospinal fluid and that recycle cerebrospinal fluid. Now, in this image here, um, what I'm looking at now, it's a rotating image I got from Wikipedia's Media Commons, and it just shows some of the aqueduct uh, ventricle structure within the uh, cerebrospinal um, fluid system. Again, I'm curious to see, once I've recorded this down to an MP4 video, if this will show up as a moving image. If not, uh, just do a search on Wikipedia and you'll almost certainly find this image. And it's just cool to kind of get a sense uh, where these systems lie within the brain. Here's another image and it just illustrates how there are these pathways that cerebrospinal fluid flow, th flow in throughout the central nervous system, meaning the spinal cord and the brain, both kind of within the brain or in deep up inside the brain, but also around the brain, providing uh, support and also kind of, um, uh, kind of physical uh, protection for the brain. So here's a connection to another disorder which you might have heard about or which you might uh, see if you're a practicing neuropsychologist. Um, the hydrocephalus or water on the brain is a condition that can occur developmentally in, in infants where that cerebrospinal uh, fluid system doesn't drain properly. You know, there's not a proper draining and recycling of the fluid within the system. The ventricles of the brain uh, as a result will enlarge and exert pressure uh, on the, the tissue of the brain which will deform the skull and also damage uh, the brain itself. Um, <clears throat> it can be treated by draining the, uh, the cerebrospinal uh, fluid system, but if it's not treated properly, it, it can result in severe damage to the brain and eventually to death. So along with the cerebrospinal system, there's the cerebrovascular system of the brain. And this are, these are um, all the arteries that take blood to the brain and, take, and the veins that take blood away from the brain. So here's a diagram here that you can see um, in greater detail all the different uh, arteries uh, that supply blood to the brain. You've probably heard of some of these before, you know, for instance, the carotid artery, um, the basilar artery, and so on and so on. It's not super important right now that we memorize all of these, but just be aware that the brain uh, needs to be supplied with quite a bit of blood, um, and it is by these various arteries, and there are veins which take the blood away from the um, the brain away from the central nervous system back towards the heart. Now here's a connection to a disorder that you've almost certainly heard about and that you would probably encounter if you're practicing as a neuropsychologist and that is a cerebrovascular accident or more commonly stroke. This, are, uh, this is the name given to various types of damage that can occur in the cerebrovascular system with the result of damage to the nervous system itself, damage to different parts of the brain. So you've probably heard of ischemic stroke. Um, this is a condition where a blood vessel becomes partially or fully blocked. It can be called an infarct. Uh, it's the result of atherosclerosis. Gosh, when I did this lecture live the other day, I totally screwed up that word. I don't know what it is about it that's so difficult for me to pronounce. Anyway, this uh, atherosclerosis is a buildup of plaque within 
the blood vessels of the body. It can occur throughout the body's circulatory system, but when it occurs in the cerebrovascular system, it can be particularly um, problematic because it can result in thrombosis or embolism that can damage tissue of the brain and limit blood supply to the brain. There are different types of stroke. It's not incredibly important that we memorize all the different types right now, but just to illustrate or to further discuss this point, there's hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, by the way, you can see in a uh, CT scan of a hemorrhagic stroke, rather large one here in this, uh, on this slide. Hemorrhagic stroke uh, involves uh, blood vessels leaking or bursting that will limit supply of blood to the brain, you know, to the parts that would otherwise be supplied by that blood vessel, and can result in damage as blood builds up outside of the blood vessel and starts to pool and exert pressure on surrounding nervous tissue. Here's another image kind of giving an, an example of different types of stroke. There's a hemorrhagic stroke where there's a bursting of a, a blood vessel or a leaking of a blood vessel that reduces the amount of blood that gets supplied to the appropriate areas of the brain and also results in damage to the area or in and around the area where the leak or the burst occurs. There's an ischemic stroke, which you can also see here. This is where um, there's a blockage uh, of the blood flow, and here it's not so much damage from pressure, although that can occur, but more damage or, in addition, damage from loss of blood supply to different parts of the brain, which, of course, need quite a bit of blood to function properly. An aneurysm is a similar type of condition, except here uh, we just have a blood vessel swelling. It doesn't necessarily break or, or, or burst or leak, um, but similar idea. It limits blood supply to the brain, and there's damage around the area of the aneurysm because of pressure. So here you can see, um, I think this is another CT scan. We're looking at an image in the brain that's uh, been stained. It's probably like radio uh, isotope stained. Um, Anyway, you can see the swelling there of that aneurysm. The area of the brain around where that's occurring is probably sustained damage as a result. So as a neuropsychologist, you could imagine being called in to evaluate a, a, a patient or um, a client who has suffered a stroke or is suspected of having suffered a stroke. Um, and what that would look like to you in your evaluation would probably probably be some loss of functioning, and the loss of functioning would have a lot to do with the area of the brain that was damaged, either from pressure or from blood loss, and that, of course, is based on the location of the cerebrovascular event, and, uh, you know, the, the uh, you can get quite technical about this, and, and people who work with stroke patients a lot do know a lot about the cerebrovascular system. Here, just to kind of give a pr brief summary, you can see these two images that indicate areas that are uh, supplied with blood uh, by different arteries, the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery. And if you notice damage, um, or if you notice loss of function in a part of the brain that you knew was supplied by, let's say, the middle cerebral artery, you might be able to guess that probably the stroke occurred somewhere in the middle cerebral artery. So uh, sometimes we can identify strokes or other cerebral vascular events through imaging. Sometimes that's not possible, and the best we can do is make a guess based on loss of function and our knowledge as neuropsychologists of the parts of the vascular system that supply blood to the part of the brain that is responsible, at least in part, for the function which has apparently now been lost or impaired. In severe cases, uh, strokes can be very obvious. A person can have a sudden loss of functioning. The stroke may be visible on, an, uh, on brain imaging or may be fairly obvious from neuropsychological investigation. What's probably more common, though, is a uh, degenerative pattern of multiple small events over time, like a multi-infarct or vascular um, series of events um, that can lead to a condition called multi-infarct or vascular dementia, where uh, for a particular person there's gradual loss of a broad range of functioning as multiple little strokes over time take their toll or damage the brain. And these are these can be strokes which are not so sudden as to arouse anyone's immediate concern, or if they do, they may be small enough that they're difficult or impossible to detect on imaging, or difficult or impossible to detect um, in the acute phase with neuropsychological testing. But over time, it just is the case that grandma or uncle 
uh, has lost a lot of who and he used to be or who she used to be or what he used to be able to do. And the suspicion is that this could be the result of vascular dementia. Later on in this class, when I talk about the R-bands, it's a neuropsychology battery, part of what I like about the R-bands is it can be used to differentiate between likely cases of vascular and non-vascular dementia. Because dementia, that is to say degenerative loss of neuropsychological functioning, can occur because of vascular events or can occur because of other reasons, you know, for instance, like Alzheimer's disease. And sometimes as a neuropsychologist, you want to be able to differentiate the two, or at least make an educated guess. Okay, so we've talked about the cerebrospinal and cerebrovascular system. We're still at this kind of macroscopic level. Let's talk about broad areas of structure within the central nervous system, especially within the brain, and talk about some of the functions associated with those different structures. And if that wasn't clear enough, um, you know, just to further emphasize that point, the way I like to teach uh, about neuropsychology, I guess it reflects kind of the way I think about this stuff or how I was trained, is to try and see the connections between particular structures and particular functions within the brain. Um, and this isn't, you know, my own idiosyncratic way of thinking. We often try and think about the brain in terms of what part does what thing. And in some cases, we can isolate a particular function or localize a particular function to one part of the brain. In other uh, cases, as we'll see, there are some functions in uh, neuropsychology which seem rather broadly distributed and may involve multiple different structures in different regions of the brain. Nonetheless, I think it's important or at least useful to think about this connection between structures and functions, structures and functions, and maybe even structures and functions in particular disorders, diseases, or conditions. Something else to think about just as we proceed forward is the complexity of the brain, uh, it can be daunting to think about, but one way to kind of make sense of that complexity is to look at it through an evolutionary perspective. If we think about the development of animals, uh, not that cats literally evolved from rats or the chimpanzees evolved from cats, but we think about the sort of the evolution of animals, uh, mammals and non-mammals, from relatively simpler organisms to relatively more complex organisms, of course humans being kind of at the top of the heap, so to speak. And if we think about the brains of these different organisms, what we see is that the relatively older areas are conserved, that is, areas that govern just basic bodily uh, functions, autonomic functions, areas that function, uh, that govern basic basic motor and sensory uh, functions, those are pretty similar across almost all animals. And they're, they're in a sense, conserved over evolutionary time. You know, they do a good job and evolution doesn't, uh, they're not selected against in terms of natural selection for evolution. Um, it's those newer structures, uh, which newer in the in sort of evolutionary time, which appear kind of overlaid on the top. So if you think about the brain, or if you say the word brain, you know, the image that I think it conjures in most people's mind is that sort of wrinkly mass of stuff that's inside your skull. Well, that's part of the brain, but it's the relatively newer stuff of the brain, the stuff which we generally call sort of association areas, because they have to do with the stuff, or they have to do with the functions that we associate with thinking and reasoning, stuff that humans do more so than do other animals. And some animals, other primates, for instance, do more so than non-primate mammals, and mammals do somewhat more so than other organisms, and so on and so on. So again, this picture is a little misleading. I'm trying to suggest that, you know, this is a straight evolutionary line from rats to humans, but the general idea of increasing sophistication in the brain involving the addition of new structures on top of, so to speak, older structures. I think it makes sense and hopefully helps you organize your thinking about how the brain uh, and, and other parts of the central nervous system are put together. So with that in mind, let's go to sort of way back or to the most basic parts of the brain, that is the hind brain. Um, uh, the hindbrain involves a number of different structures. Uh, I'll highlight just a few of them here that I think are interesting or important to know about. One of them is the reticular formation, reticular meaning net-like. Uh, this is a set of neurons that exist kind of down in the hindbrain or what's sometimes called the brain stem. They project their axons upwards and forwards into the higher areas of the brain and they're responsible for a lot of basic functions that uh, we need to kind of keep going and keep alive. Uh, our basic arousal, um, some aspects of attention, some aspects of sleep, 
um, are governed at least or, or controlled at least somewhat by the reticular formation. So if you're if you're fast asleep and I shine a bright light on, on your face, you'll wake up. How does that happen? Well, there's a part of your visual uh, pathway that projects down to your reticular formation and when you're stimulate with light that part that pathway activates it activates the reticular formation which then kind of turns up the activity in many other parts of the brain and you become awake and you become alert and orient towards me and ask you know why'd you shine a light in my face <laughs> Um, by the way, you know, people noticed like way back in, you know, neuroscience researchers way back in the 40s noticed that if you damage this part of the brain, if you damage the hindbrain, and particularly if you damage the reticular formation, the, uh, the animal, the human, whoever it is who's sustained the damage will lapse into a coma or even die. So you can imagine as a neuropsychologist, if you were called in to evaluate someone who had, uh, you know, had been in a motorcycle accident and, and maybe their head had really whiplashed around and they sustained damage to, there's a suspicion they'd sustained damage to part of their hindbrain. You might look for uh, inability to sustain arousal. If the person's sort of lapsing in and out of a coma, that might reflect damage to this part of the brain. Elsewhere in the hindbrain, we have the medulla and the pons. Um, these are structures, you can kind of vaguely see them here on this uh, CT scan, they're kind of highlighted slightly, that control some basic involuntary functions that are also kind of necessary to keep you alive. Things like keeping your heart beating, uh, keeping you breathing, uh, allowing you to swallow if something's in your mouth or vo vomit if something's sort of stuck in your esophagus. Um, allowing you to sleep and then wake up. These are things which all have to do with activity in the hindbrain generally, but specifically in the medulla and in the pons. Um, and you can again see those there. Here's an image over here of the medulla. And here's an image of the pons. They're sort of both there back in the the uh, hindbrain, or what's sometimes called the brainstem, kind of at the very top of the spinal cord and kind of up underneath the other parts of the brain that we are going to talk about, or at least some of which we're going to talk about. Here's just something else to think about or not think about as the case may be. It's just interesting for me, and maybe for you too, to reflect upon the fact that um, when we think about the brain and all the stuff it can do, most of the stuff that the brain does occurs outside of our awareness, and, and that's good. You know, we we don't need to consciously think about chewing or, or swallowing, or we don't need to consciously think, okay, heart, keep beating, beat heart, you know, keep breathing. We don't need to consciously coordinate, at least most of the time, we don't need to consciously coordinate a lot of our muscle movements. If we did, we'd probably be a lot harder for us to survive. A lot of that unconscious stuff, that keeping the body going, is taking place in lower areas of the brain, so to speak, areas like the hindbrain. If we move a little upwards and forwards, so to speak, we get into an area called the midbrain. Um, by the way, I should say, I probably should have said earlier, that these, these, um, these area distinctions, hindbrain, midbrain, forebrain, um, are arrived at partly through convention and partly through just kind of old school, school neurological examination. You know, the, the, the noticing, the observation that different types of neurons exist in different parts of the brain led neurologists to, to kind of identify different regions within the brain. Um, but it's not the case that, you know, there's, there are clear boundaries or, or signage like, hey, you're leaving the hindbrain, you're entering the midbrain. Some of this is, is kind of a matter of tradition and to some extent convenience. So again, as we move kind of upwards and forwards from the hindbrain, we get to the midbrain. There's interesting stuff here. I'm just going to highlight a few features. Um, uh, one set of features really are the cranial nerves. These are nerves which uh, are important for um, base, some aspects of basic sensation and also some very important aspects of autonomic functioning and motor functioning. Uh, there are a lot of them here. Uh, you know, probably for the purpose of my class, don't need to memorize all of them, but some of these you've probably heard of, like the basic optic nerve, which passes information down your uh, visual pathways. Um, the uh, vagus nerve, which acts as kind of a regulator on your heart rate. You know, you can 
acts it sort of acts as a brake slowing down your heart under certain situations these uh, cranial nerves are important again if you were a uh, a neuropsychologist brought in to evaluate someone who'd sustained an injury a head injury in an accident you might be looking for loss of particular types of functioning loss of control of facial muscles loss of normal heart rate variability um, loss of ocular motor control and if you notice those losses or those deficits you might be able to speculate that the person's head injury had involved damage to one or more of these cranial nerves. That's the basic idea there. So if I step back to the idea of structures and functions, structures and functions, to, and summarize a little bit, we can say, look, in the hindbrain and in the midbrain, at least some areas of the midbrain, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of structures which serve some basic functions. And these are functions of autonomic survival. So the stuff which keeps your lights on, so to speak, and keeps you alive and keeps you not in a coma or dead, a lot of that stuff is happening in the hindbrain and in the midbrain. You know, that said, there's stuff going on down here, so to speak, that involves cognitive functions which are distributed more broadly throughout the, the brain. And so I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but something like attention, right? Attention is a, is a cognitive uh, faculty. It's, a, it's something we, of course, study quite a bit, and it's something we're all kind of aware is really important for us to, to get around in the world. Attention as a function involves things like the reticular formation, but it also involves uh, higher areas of the brain as well. So for instance, another area of the brain that's involved in attention is the singular cortex, or the cingulate cortex, I'm sorry. Um, this, uh, the, especially the anterior cingulate cortex, you can see that highlighted there in this um, uh, fMRI scan, um, controls aspects of attention, especially we think selective attention. It receives inputs from the reticular formation and it itself projects inputs further into other areas of the brain. So connections between the hindbrain, way down kind of the, in the brainstem, if you will, and the forebrain. Again, here you can see, um, or I can see as I'm watching moving images, hopefully when you're watching my video, these things are moving too. But even if they're not, you kind of get a sense where the cingulate cortex is kind of in usually it's usually identified as being in the forebrain, but you can see it's kind of basically further upwards and forwards from the areas we've been talking about before, the areas of the hindbrain and the midbrain. To connect this to a disorder or condition that you are probably familiar with, or at least you've heard of, and that you might study if you're a neuropsychologist, schizophrenia um, is you know, a complex condition um, which can involve deficits in a range of different areas and probably has a lot of uh, different aspects of pathology. One thing that is, seems to be going on with schizophrenia is dysfunction in the cingulate gyrus or the cingulate cortex um, that is, we think, related to deficits in selective attention. So among their other problems that they have, people with schizophrenia have difficulty in selective attention tasks. Um, in their just day-to-day -day living, they have a hard time uh, directing their attention towards relevant stimuli and selecting the relevant from the irrelevant stimuli. This may have to do with dysfunction in the cingulate cortex or cingulate gyrus. So again, to go back to uh, structures and functions, there are areas within the hindbrain and also areas within the forebrain, which we might call our attentional systems or systems which serve attentional functions. And this is probably a good example of how something, a function like attention, really isn't localized to just one part of the brain. And probably that's true for most of the stuff we study, attention, memory, language, etc. These things uh, don't live in one and only one part of your brain. They often involve the interaction of multiple different areas. While we're on the topic, you know, something to think about is maybe, or something to question, what is attention? Um, attention, it's obviously a variable you've heard about before, you've probably studied in other classes. If you've taken a cognitive psychology class, you may have used tests of attention in your research. Uh, you may be working hard to sustain attention on my lecture right now. Um, it's difficult to define precisely what attention is, uh, but we can probably think of it best as a complex set of functions and related structures within the brain. 
So when we try and think about the functions that go along with attention, there are things like orienting towards novel stimuli, selecting appropriate from inappropriate stimuli, or relevant from irrelevant stimuli, uh, maintaining attention on multiple distinct stimuli, divided attention, sustaining attention over time, something that maybe some of you are trying to do right now, hopefully not failing at, at least not yet. Um, and like I said before, probably there are multiple interrelated structures that govern these various functions which we collectively call attention or which we refer to as aspects of attention and you know at the risk of getting too repetitious here it's worth noting that these uh, structures are not localized in one part of the brain and probably that's true for most of these uh, functions that we're trying to talk about uh, in neuropsychology and other aspects of psychology Okay, so stepping away from attention for a moment, let's kind of go back to the hindbrain, kind of where we were before, before we ventured forward into the midbrain and forebrain. Back in the hindbrain, there are a couple more things to talk about, or a couple more points to highlight. One is the cerebellum. Cerebellum uh, meaning little brain. It's an area kind of at the back of the brain, uh, and it is responsible for helping you coordinate voluntary movements. Uh, it's responsible for maintaining appropriate rhythm for movements. It receives uh, connections from the basal ganglia. You can he see here in this image both basal ganglia and the cerebellum highlighted in this uh, CT scan. Um, the idea is that if you um, if your cerebellum is working properly you can do complex movements like walking across the room or picking up a cup of coffee or speaking uh, quite well. So well that you don't really think about it much at all. You don't have to try very hard to do it. Um, if the cerebellum is impaired or damaged, of course that doesn't work quite so well. So for instance, uh, I had a you know, we've, I've had the experience, maybe some of you have too, of drinking a little bit too much alcohol and you begin to stumble in your walk or you even slur your speech. Well, why is that happening? It's because alcohol is impairing um, GABA and glutamate receptors in your uh, cerebellum, which is making your cerebellum less able to do its normal job. And it's less able to coordinate all the different movements that have to take place in the right sequence for you to speak clearly or for you to walk clearly. That's why, you know, if you've ever seen or maybe even uh, experienced in your own life uh, a field sobriety test. You know, the police officer might administer to someone who's suspected of being intoxicated. They often involve things like kind of, uh, you know, speaking a sentence or walking on a straight line, things which you can do quite easily if you're not drunk or if you haven't sustained damage to your uh, cerebellum, but which you can't do very easily if your cerebellum just isn't working so well. Here's just another one of those images that I got from Wikipedia's uh, Media Commons. Uh, again, hopefully this is rotating on your video. It's rotating on my laptop as I'm recording. You can just see the cerebellum kind of tucked in the back behind, uh, in a sense, below and behind the main portion of the brain. The word cerebellum just meaning kind of little, little brain, little cortex. I mentioned alcohol intoxication before. There are other conditions that can uh, result in damage to the cerebellum. You, know, you can imagine someone sustaining a fall and banging the back of their head. Um, if you, as a neuropsychologist, were called in to evaluate someone who's who had sustained this type of injury, you might look for um, uh, you know, disorders like nystagmus or if, uh, failures of nystagmus, that's the coordination of eye movements. You know, if you were to uh, follow with your eyes a moving uh, object, like a target, you know, the end of the, uh, the doctor's um, pencil or the, the little light that the doctor or, or the ophthalmologist or the neuropsychologist moves back and forth, your eyes, each one of them rotate. They don't rotate by exactly the same number of degrees because if they did, you would go off target. You have to kind of coordinate those movements and maintain steady gaze. If you don't do that, um, it could indicate damage in other parts of your brain, but it could also indicate damage in your cerebellum. Similar idea is the vestibular ocular reflex. If you uh, try to maintain fixed gaze on a target, like a picture on the wall, or again, you know, the doctor holding up his or her finger, but maintain that gaze while moving your head back and forth, that's really easy for you to do. You don't even really have to think about it. your eyes. Um, in a sense, move to offset the movement of your overall head. You know, your gaze stays locked even though your head is tilting back and forth. Um, yeah, again, if you've 
play sports and you're trying to catch a football that's being thrown to you while you're running or you're trying to catch a frisbee while you're running you're doing this you're keeping your eye on the ball or your eye on the frisbee while your whole body not just your head is moving very easy for you to do uh, unless you've had damage to your cerebellum in which case you have a uh, loss of functioning in this uh, vestibular ocular reflex and this could be noted by a neuropsychologist or another professional evaluating you if you if you were a patient had sustained this type of damage so moving a little forward and upwards again from the hindbrain we're in the midbrain or at least we're in an area of the mid which is usually characterized as the midbrain um, here we encounter a whole bunch of other structures i'm not going to name all of them i will highlight one or two uh, the substantia nigra meaning of course the the dark or black body of the brain is just a part of the brain that exists in an area which we usually call the midbrain and it's responsible or it's involved in voluntary uh, muscle movements especially uh, goal-directed behavior so you can see here um, on this image i hope where the substantia nigra is it's kind of tucked in around other structures like the thalamus and the superior supra a thalamic nuclei kind of in if you will the middle of the brain hence kind of midbrain again some textbooks will put this in the forebrain or we'll, we'll call this part of the forebrain others will call it part of the midbrain the precise distinction for me and for us right now is not super important but just try and get a vague sense of where this thing is to make a connection to a disorder which you've almost certainly heard about parkinson's disease involves damage to uh, or and degeneration to uh, the nuclei of the substantia nigra and other uh, basal ganglia the substantia nigra is sometimes grouped in with the basal ganglia which are different collections of neurons which are involved in voluntary muscle movement you can see here um, a section portion of the midbrain um, that is normal you can see the darkened regions which are where the cell bodies are uh, for uh, normal uh, neurons in the substantia nigra you can also see a section portion of the midbrain here where that darkened area is gone or at least it's reduced that's because those neurons are are dead or gone or at least not functioning properly and the result of this is parkinson's disease or i should say this result this can result from parkinson's disease uh, and can produce parkinson's disease symptoms and you may be familiar with these if you have a family member you know, an older um, uh, you know uncle or aunt or grandma or grandpa who has parkinson's disease or if you've seen the actor uh, and now activist for parkinson's disease research michael j fox if you've seen him give an interview parkinson's disease involves kind of a, a tremoring or it can involve like a tremoring a difficulty initiating voluntary movements people you know can even tremor or tremble in their speech uh, this is because dopamine uh, neurons in the substantia nigra have been damaged and it's less easy for the body to initiate a movement once the movement initiate you know gets going it can be sustained over time and in fact if you treat people um, for parkinson's disease they're often given dopamine agonist drugs drugs which stimulate the production and release of, of dopamine like l-dopa which is a dopamine precursor or they can be given other stimulants um, interestingly and this you know takes me back to my class on drugs and alcohol uh, people who abuse stimulants like cocaine or amphetamine or methamphetamine over a long enough periods of time in their life will damage parts of their basal ganglia including their substantia nigra and can have as a result parkinson's disease like symptoms um, also people who um, sustain lots of head injuries from boxing or or from other sports which give you concussions can get uh, parkinson's disease like symptoms as well um, so bottom line is it's that voluntary uh, movement which is in, which involves um, this particular region of the midbrain and damage that can occur there i mentioned the basal ganglia just a you know minute or two ago this is our, our a group of nuclei meaning a group of clusters of neurons um, that are uh, in and around the thalamus in and around the midbrain and kind of connecting into the forebrain i'm not going to go through all of them here but for our purpose is it's just worth noting that they're responsible or that they're involved with a uh, goal directed behavior so moving towards things that you need to move towards whether it's walking across a room or picking up a piece of paper to write a you know write a sentence or whatever else 
Now here's that same image that uh, I showed you before. Um, again, sometimes the uh, substantia nigra is grouped in with the basal ganglia. Other times, at least in my reading of different textbooks, other times it's not. The substantia nigra involve, or I'm sorry, the basal ganglia here in this image involves things like the caudate nucleus, the putamen, um, the globus pallidus, and so on. Um, again, for our purposes, it's just worth noting that these are structures which are involved in voluntary beha behaviors, especially voluntary movements, and when there's damage there or degeneration there, those types of functions, voluntary movements, uh, get impaired. I mentioned the thalamus already. Um, the thalamus is a portion of uh, what's sometimes uh, put in or located in the forebrain. It's sometimes located in the limbic system, which is a collection of structures which are themselves sometimes put in the forebrain or you know the word limbic and limbic system refers to the boundary suggesting they're kind of on the boundary between the midbrain and the forebrain anyway you probably remember from your intro psych class or your biology class the thalamus serves a lot of functions including it's kind of like a relay station for sensory and motor information interestingly except for smell smell um, doesn't or your olfactory system doesn't kind of pass through your thalamus which may explain why um, olfactory action can have such a powerful effect on emotions and behavior and sometimes a very direct um, sort of potent effect. Um, anyway, so the thalamus involves, uh, you know, is kind of a relay station that seems to be necessary for integrating aspects of sensory information and also for connecting motor, out, uh, motor commands from higher cortical areas down through to areas of the basal ganglia and elsewhere. Here is a, another one of my images that I just got from Wikipedia, um, and you can see, hopefully, either rotating or not, just kind of roughly where the thalamus is. It's highlighted in red here. Now, if we go sort of fully forward and upwards, we get to the cortex. And the cortex, kind of like I said before, it's the part of the brain that I think most people think of or picture in their minds when someone says brain. It's this big sort of wrinkly mass that flops over and on top of almost all the other stuff we've talked about before. And uh, as you, again, probably remember from your intro psych or your biology class, there are all sorts of different uh, functions which are located in different structures or regions within the cortex. Um, stuff, most of this stuff has to do with, you know, so-called higher functioning, uh, things like um, you know, s speech and language or the ability to hear things or see things and so on. Let's just focus on a few of these things and maybe particularly let's think a little bit about how uh, we are able to learn things and specifically how we're able to hear and see stuff that we might need to hear or see if we're in class like these uh, cute young children are here. Again, you probably remember from other classes that your temporal lobe is where, uh, is where is located a lot of your auditory cortex. This is the part of the cortex which seems to be involved in audition or hearing. And you probably remember that the occipital lobe is the area where um, uh, what's kind of the end point of your visual pathways is the location of the visual cortex where a lot of your processing of visual information takes place. So you could imagine as a neuropsychologist being brought in to evaluate someone who sustained a head injury, maybe they've fallen and again really cracked the back of their head, you might be particularly concerned about damage to their occipital lobe and you might perform a basic visual uh, vision test yourself or refer the person out for testing by uh, you know, an ophthalmologist. Um, or an optometrist, I always forget which one is, is which, but you know the idea, a formal vision test. You could also imagine as a neuropsychologist evaluating uh, people for their auditory and their visual abilities if you're concerned about learning. So you're some, you've been brought in to evaluate a, a child who's having difficulty in class, you know, he or she you know, maybe it has been suggested maybe they have attention deficit disorder, maybe they have a learning uh, disorder. Uh, one of the things you hopefully would do is either yourself conduct uh, a basic auditory and visual uh, audition and vision testing or refer the person out for those tests because if the child or if the person can't hear properly or can't see properly, that's going to impair learning and also impair performance on all your tests. Just a, a quick note as to how these functions, which are so important, uh, are connected to basic structures and need to be evaluated. 
So again, um, if we want to think about structures and functions, structures and functions, we can say really generally the forebrain, especially areas in the temporal lobe and the occipital lobe, are important for sensory uh, processing. And here we're focused, of course, mostly on audition and vision. Another a function or probably set of functions that are localized in the cortex are those associated with speech and with language. And again, if you've taken other uh, psych classes or neuroscience classes, you probably are familiar with Broca's area located in the frontal lobe and Wernicke's area located in the occipital lobe. These are important for processing different aspects of, of speech and language. So Wernicke's area located in the superior temporal gyrus, gyrus so again in the temporal lobe, um, is important for receptive language, that is the ability to understand language. And if there's damage or degeneration to this area, we can sometimes observe, observe a condition called receptive aphasia or Wernicke's aphasia or fluent aphasia or sometimes even called sensory aphasia. And this is, of course, just difficulty understanding spoken and even written language. And it can be very severe to the point where the person, you know, really just can't comprehend language. They're, they're aware that, you know, when people are speaking to them, uh, but they don't quite understand the meaning of what's happening. Or it can be rather mild. You know, there are cases of mild aphasia where people can be, um, in a sense, it's, there are some odd cases where people can be like overly literal with their understanding of language. Like you say, oh, you know, it's raining cats and dogs outside, and they look at you all confused, like, how is, how is that possible? That, that might be indicative of a mild uh, receptive aphasia that may be the result of damage or degeneration in Wernicke's area or other, you know, close areas in the temporal lobe. Speech and language are also are also involve Broca's area, which is in the inferior frontal gyrus, so kind of in the frontal cortex, um, inferior, you know, to the um, or sort of on that lower gyrus in the frontal cortex. Broca's area is, in, uh, is involved in expressive language, the ability to produce language. And again, we can see uh, if there's damage or degeneration in this area, we can sometimes observe a form of aphasia, which is called expressive or non-fluent aphasia, where the person has difficulty speaking or even writing language. And, and like other forms of aphasia, can be rather mild or it can be very, very severe. And in severe cases, the person just can't literally produce words. They can understand what is being told to them, um, unless there's damage to other parts of their speech and, and language systems, uh, but they can't actually produce language that will uh, correspond to answers to questions and so on. So again, just think about structures and functions, structures and functions. We can say that there are areas in the forebrain, especially some specialized areas in the frontal and temporal lobes that seem to be really important for speech and language uh, functions. And there are speech and language systems. And again, you know, if you could imagine as a neuropsychologist, if you were called in to do some testing and you observed in the client difficulty understanding language or difficulty expressing language, somewhere you should be thinking, gosh, you know, is it possible that there's pathology, you know, damage or degeneration in areas that are responsible for these different functions, speech and language. Other stuff that's going on in the forebrain, in the cortex, um, are a whole load of functions which we collectively call executive functions. You've probably uh, heard in other classes of the frontal lobe as being this part of the brain that's really important for like decision making or for uh, planning responses or, in, or inhibiting inappropriate responses, etc., etc., etc. Like I said before, these are often called collectively executive functioning, uh, which really, you know, suggests that they're really a collection of different processes that are probably sort of related. There's cognitive flexibility, being able to switch from one set of rules to another. You know, if you're playing a, a, a game where the rules change, can you adapt so as to play appropriately or do you keep getting stuck with your old way of responding? Can you learn new rules? Can you plan your responses? Can you initiate an appropriate response to a challenge or a puzzle or a question or inhibit an inappropriate response uh, to a challenge or a puzzle or a question or so on? Generally speaking, the frontal lobe has a lot to do with these functions, or at least it appears to. We often identify the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which you can see here highlighted in, in kind of an off yellow color, as being particularly important for those functions.
If you think back to your intro psych class, you probably remember the story of Phineas Gage, a, a uh, ill-fated railway worker who sustained massive damage to his frontal lobes, uh, which at the time he survived, which is itself kind of miraculous. Uh, but also what was miraculous is his intellectual capacity seemed largely intact. You know, he didn't lose his language abilities. He didn't lose his overall intellectual uh, abilities. He was about as intelligent as, as he was before. He had memory still. He could see, he could hear, but at the time it was observed by his colleagues that his personality seemed to change. He seemed to become a lot more impulsive and risk-taking, which really is, you know, began neuroscience's uh, neurology and later neuroscience and psychology's fascination with the frontal lobes and the role that they play in this ability to manage one's own behavior. And the story of Gage is that he became this kind of crazed guy who was really he sort of he went from being very straight laced and orderly in his life to being wildly reckless the real history of gage is actually a lot more complicated than that but um the basic take home that the frontal lobes seem to be involved in managing behavior uh choosing appropriate reactions stuff which we would group in with the executive functions that more or less holds true to today and of course we don't need to have massive damage to that part of the brain. There can be impairment in the frontal cortex, which can have the result of impulsive behavior. You know, it could be sort of overt impulsive acts like aggression, you know, pictured somewhat in a silly fashion here in this picture. If we give people a lot of alcohol, um, the frontal lobes become impaired because alcohol messes up different parts of your brain, just like your poor old cerebellum and your hippocampus and other parts. It messes up the functioning of your frontal lobe and people who are drunk will do and say things that they probably otherwise wouldn't. Um, we also, you know, one of the explanations for um, how attention deficit disorder occurs is that there is uh, dysfunction or decreased activity in the frontal lobes, and uh, that's why students or young people who have attention deficit disorder are not able to attend to the right stimuli, or they can be a little impulsive when they try to plan their responses to, to questions that are posed to them by teachers or parents. Uh, one of the explanations for why stimulant medications, uh, like amphetamine for instance, treat quite successfully <coughs> attention deficit disorder is that these drugs increase activity in different parts of the brain, including the frontal lobes, which may sort of turn up the activity in the frontal lobe, giving the person better executive control, better ability to select and sustain attention when appropriate. So again, structures and functions, functions and structures, we can say, generally speaking, four brain areas, especially the frontal lobes of the cortex, maybe even more, especially the dorsal lateral prefrontal lobes of the cortex, seem to be really important for this group of uh, connected ideas or functions that we call the executive functions. Still in the forebrain, still in the cortex, I'd be sort of remiss if I didn't note that there are... Um, that these, this uh, part of the brain can tr includes both the motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex. You've almost certainly seen images like this in other textbooks or classes, this kind of bands of tissue that um, uh, exist in the cortex. They actually, what we're seeing here is kind of the gray matter of these cortices, and they extend downwards, as you can see, uh, in the case of the motor uh, cortex, their axons into lower parts of the brain, into the midbrain and the hindbrain, and they receive uh, projections from those areas upwards, as you can see in the case of the somatosensory cortex. So we get that kind of dark matter, or, or dark um, matter, white matter parts of the brain uh, when we look at the somatosensory and um, motor cortex. And again, just to kind of really uh, briefly summarize this idea, we can say that there are parts of the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain that are involved in motor coordination. So if you're, if you're planning to uh, initiate a behavior that involves aspects of your forebrain or areas in your forebrain, areas in your midbrain, and areas even in your hindbrain. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground, and hopefully you're still sustaining attention with me. I've got a little bit more that I want to cover. Um, I want to move on from talking about uh, you know, motor activity and executive functioning. I want to talk about another uh, cognitive or kind of uh, neurocognitive functioning uh, function, that is memory. And um, I'm not a deep reader in uh, English literature, um, despite the fact that my mom is English and herself is a big reader. But uh, this quote from Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, I think, is, is appropriate here. Um, she just wonders, you know, if any one faculty of nature may be called more wonderful than the rest, I do think it is memory. 
The memory is sometimes so retentive, so serviceable, so obedient, and at other times so bewildering, so weak, and at others again so beyond control. Um, memory is this thing that is uh, at once very obvious and familiar to us. I think almost all of us, you know, of, of course, experience our own memories. But the more you think about it, the more kind of magical it seems. You know, memory is kind of who we are. It's, it's the, all the stuff we remember up to very now, the story we tell ourselves about who we are and what we did and what we, uh, the type of person we, the type of lives we've had, this is all in some way tied up in our memory. And a little bit like, um, a little bit like attention, we can say of memory, we often think of it like it's one thing, but really it's probably a lot of different functions. And uh, those functions are probably instantiated or distributed across a lot of different structures. So there are different ways of organizing memory and people who study memory have their own preferred systems. People who test memory have their own preferred systems. The one that I'm using, I'm drawing from our textbook, and that is to consider different polarities of memory. Um, episodic versus semantic, declarative versus procedural, and so on. And to be clear, these aren't probably distinct types of memory, but maybe they're rather different ways of thinking about memory or different ways of thinking about the things that collectively we call memory. And as I've said before with regards to memory, and as you may remember, haha, about me saying about other functions, um, these are probably not localized to a particular part of the brain. In fact, people who study memory, I think are, you know, for the most part would acknowledge that memory is this really widely distributed uh, set of functions uh, that don't live just in this one and only one part of the brain. Anyway, just really quickly, some of those polarities, uh, episodic memory, memories of events and experiences, semantic memory, general knowledge that's not necessarily tied to specific experiences. So you, you may remember, um, again, you rem may remember a particular tragedy or a particular historical event because you were there, you have episodic memory of it, or you may have a kind of a general knowledge understanding of it, like a, you know, a particular assassination or a particular election or so. You know, you didn't live through that time, but you, you know of it, you've been told about it, and thus it is in your memory, but not as an episode that you yourself have experienced. Working memory, uh, memory, uh, or in the ability to retain information for short periods of time, and in some cases perform simple uh, manipulations on it. Associative memory, um, the capacity to draw to mind things once you've been cued or stimulated for them. You know, if you, if you. Uh, give someone a prime or a cue, it will bring to light or remind them of a particular piece of information that was in their memory, but it wasn't something they were actively maintaining or retaining um, and manipulating up until the point that you, you, uh, that, that, you that you stimulated or cued it. Declarative memory, knowledge of facts, the sort of the what of memory, as distinct from procedural memory, knowledge of how to do stuff. You know, you can think about having declarative memory for how to drive a car. You sort of understand roughly, you know, how to drive a stick shift. But you probably, if you drive a stick shift, have a lot of procedural memory. You don't grind the gears or miss them as you drive. You you can easily just remember the procedure of um, of uh, of shifting. Um, I'm sure if you're a sports psychologist or if you're a neuropsychologist, you know, brought in to consult with a group of sports psychologists, you could spend a lot of time talking about transitioning people from declarative memory about how to play a particular sport or how to do a particular move, uh, transitioning them from declarative memory to procedural memory. So you kind of can just go ahead and do it rather than think about or describe how to do it make a distinction between explicit and implicit memory. Explicit memory, just stuff that you have immediate ex access to. Implicit memory, which is, to me, it sounds a lot like associative memory, is stuff that's in your memory, but that's not immediately accessible to you unless it's in some way primed or triggered for you. Like There's a lot of stuff that you're remembering right now that you, in a sense, don't know you're remembering until somebody gives you a hint or a clue or a cue or a prime, and then you think, oh yeah, I remember that. I, I read that book, or I saw that person back the other day. That's in some ways can be thought of as implicit memory that you have. Short-term memory, sometimes um, sort of conflated with or combined with working memory, is this memory that, uh, for information you can hold for a relatively short period of time, at least you know, longer if you can rehearse the information, but without rehearsal for a fairly short period of time. You can maybe do some manipulation on that information. 
long-term memory is stuff that you can retain for longer times, longer durations, hours, days, months, maybe even years. Your long-term memory for things that happened years and years, years, and years ago in your life the, your, versus your short-term memory for some piece of information I just gave you a few seconds ago, and you have to remember it for a couple seconds before I ask you a question. Now, I said that, that memory is widely distributed, and that, that's almost certainly the case. Uh, there are a couple areas that are probably worth highlighting, though. Uh, the amygdala seems to be involved in controlling some aspects of memory, uh, maybe especially consolidating memories that have an emotional quality to them. The hippocampus seems to play a role in helping to transition um, information from short-term memory to long-term memory. So we know, for instance, uh, if you damage the hippocampus or if you imp impair the hippocampus, once again, alcohol. You know, if alcohol disrupts activity in the hippocampus, if you have really high levels of intoxication, you can go into an alcoholic blackout. You can not remember anything that happened for a period of time uh, because your brain was unable to take stuff that was in short-term or working memory and shift it over into long-term memory. Here are some more images. You can see uh, on the left uh, images of the amygdala, which are two bodies actually within the brain, amygdala meaning almond-like. Um, hippocampus, uh, you can see on the right, again, there are actually two structures. Um, they're sort of opposite each other. Hippocampus meaning seahorse, suggesting the sort of seahorse or prawn-like shape that they have kind of lying on their side. The amygdala is kind of tucked on the end of the hippocampus uh, there. And again, they both seem to play a role in memory, but they're by no means the only parts of the brain that are involved in memory. They're just some of the ones we are, we have better understood. I mentioned this already. I guess I got a little bit ahead of myself, but uh, why do people have memory loss when they drink alcohol or even full-on blackouts if they drink a lot of alcohol? It's because alcohol impairs activity in the hippocampus. Alcohol impairs activity almost everywhere in the brain, <laughs> and uh, it can lead to the loss of the ability, at least for a short period of time, to move information from short-term to long-term memory. A more profound uh, example of that loss of that ability to move things from short-term to long-term memory is the famous neurosurgery patient HM, who was being treated for... Um, <clears throat> Uh, he was being treated for seizures. He had a portion of his temporal lobe uh, lesioned, and uh, un un accidentally or unwittingly, parts of his hippocampus was damaged as a result of that. HM had memory loss. He had, he lost, like someone in sort of a permanent alcoholic blackout, he lost the ability to um, move information from short-term or working memory into long-term memory. Um, interestingly, though, that memory loss was particular to declarative memory. So if you gave him information, um, he would lose it very quickly and could not later on uh, explain or, or recall a piece of information that you'd given to him. He didn't have declarative memory. However, procedural memory, very interestingly, was not lost. So if you taught him a new skill, that skill, that that uh, you know, memory of that information of the of the act of doing something new, was in his memory and could be maintained for longer periods of time, suggesting that um, it's a little simplistic to say, oh, he lost the ability to form long-term memories. He lost the ability to form types of long-term memories, types that we might call more declarative memories, but procedural memories were uh, largely unaffected, probably because they involved different regions of the brain, not just the hippocampus, but maybe also, for instance, the cerebellum. And they just remind us again that memory functions are varied, and like I've said a bunch of times already, uh, memory structures or the structures involved in these various functions are quite widely distributed. A few points to think about before we uh, move off of talking about memory. Um, one is that we remember stuff that we think about. That is, we remember things that we can attach meaning to. So if I showed you this image uh, on the screen here and I asked you to remember all these characters, um, you don't need to sit there and very laboriously commit them to memory and rehearse them. You just begin to read them and you know, oh, of course that's the alphabet or that's all the single digits. So it's very easy for you to remember the entire alphabet, um, a couple typographic symbols, and then you know the digits, um, because you those you know chunk those those pieces of information can be chunked, and those chunks have meaning for you, and so it's very easy for you to quickly learn them and remember them for a very long period of time, as compared to if I'd showed you a set of abstract symbols or even just a set of letters, but ones that don't com you know completely and obviously uh, com uh, add up to the full alphabet.
So you remember stuff that you can think about, and by think about, I mean that you can attach meaning to. And as a little side point, <laughs> as an educator and someone who, who tries to learn, tries to teach and also tries to learn, it seems pretty clear that what helps students learn things is if they can make meaning out of what they're learning. You know, if you can connect a piece of information from a class <clears throat> to something that happens in your real life or that you've witnessed, it's going to be a lot easier for you to remember it. If you have a, uh, an older relative who suffers from Parkinson's disease or who has suffered a stroke, then probably the little bits of the lecture where I mentioned those disorders are going to really stick in your mind because they connect to something that you have some meaning for. And you'll probably remember them better. Um, if you don't have someone in your family with those disorders, well, well, that's of course a good thing, but then you might want to do a little bit of extra work to create some sort of connection or meaning there. Um, how does this work? Well, people seem to organize uh, things in terms of clusters or structure or hierarchical structures of information. You know, cognitive psychologists study this a lot. They also sometimes represent uh, information and memory as existing in semantic networks. You have things that are connected, have pieces of information that are connected, and the proximity of those connections reflects the tightness of those associations. Um, this seems to be pretty good evidence that memory, at least some aspects of memory, work this way because if we prime people with uh, elements of a network, like if we give someone the color red, you know, sort of show them a, a, a swatch of red color or give them the word red, and then ask them to start producing uh, in pieces of information from their memory, they're much more likely to bring up fire truck than they are to bring up police car, um, suggesting that those two bits of information are fairly closely connected to each other in some way in their long-term memory. Another thing, and I've, I guess I've kind of already mentioned this, is that we remember what we care about. Um, maybe this is why shows like Sesame Street and other great kids programs are so successful at teaching. It's because hopefully, you know, if you're like me, you like those shows and they, they meant a lot to you. Um, Emotion seems to play a big role in, in learning and memory, and maybe that shouldn't surprise us. You know, recall that the amygdala, a part of the limbic system, which seems to have a lot to do with emotions, uh, is also uh, involved in memory. And so the extent, to the extent that we can form uh, strong emotional memories, uh, you know, strong emotional connections to information, we can remember it better. At an extreme, of course, this can be problematic if people, <coughs> pardon me, if people suffer um, <clears throat> a very traumatic event in their life and have difficulty uh, because their memory of it is too severe or too disturbing. You know, hard, they have a hard time forgetting or getting over a trauma because it was so emotional, so threatening to them. You know, they might uh, be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. It might be treated that way. Anyway, memory. Again, structures and functions, functions and structures. There are all sorts of structures in the, within the brain that are involved in different aspects of memory. I'm obviously kind of uh, doing a lot of high-level hand-waving here. Um, but memory, again, seems to, it's obviously an important uh, neurocognitive function. And there are certainly are parts of the brain that we know play at least a role in some parts of it. <clears throat> I mentioned the limbic system already. Um, just to quickly highlight it, you know, you're probably familiar with the limbic system from other classes, especially intro psychology class or your abnormal psychology class. Um, <clears throat> This is a group of structures which exist kind of like at the margin between what we sometimes call the midbrain and what we sometimes call the forebrain. Again, the word limbic refers to that margin or marginal position in the brain. Um, the limbic system involves or includes the amygdala, the hippocampus, the anterior thalamic nuclei, that is to say parts of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and other structures as well. And as I've noted already, it's involved with a diverse range of functions, including emotions and memory and learning and motivation. Um, and you could imagine as a neuropsychologist, if you were brought in to evaluate someone who'd sustained damage to this part of their brain, you might be interested in not just measuring their memory or their learning, but also evaluating their emotional functioning. Are they uh, emotionally uh, balanced or have they begun to, perhaps a bit like Phineas Gage, uh, begun to have strange changes in their apparent emotional life? Here's a rather complex picture of the limbic system uh, detailing all the different parts of it. Um, again, there's a lot there uh, and different textbooks and different diagrams will group these somewhat differently. Um, this is a pretty standard uh, depiction of what's in the limbic system. 
I'll talk really briefly about a few of these structures and some of their functions in just the next few slides. The hypothalamus um, controls a wide range of functions, uh, emotional behavior, like I've already said, the hypothalamus seems to be involved in sleep and wake cycles, also in learning, also in other stuff. Here's the hypothalamus. It's just uh, right there, kind of in my little moving image. Hopefully it's moving for you when you're watching this. The hypothalamus, uh, again, this takes me back to my class I teach on drugs and alcohol. The hypothalamus is part of the dopamine, the mesolimbic dopamine pathway, which is a set of structures that go from the limbic system further forward into the forebrain and which um, are involved in goal directed behavior. That includes the hypothalamus, or include, the hypothalamus is included in that pathway. Um, it's uh, the, suggesting that it's involved in the rewarding aspects of some behavior. So for instance, if you have, you know, in, in old school um, neuroscience research with non-human animals like rats, you could implant an electrode into the hypothalamus or elsewhere in this pathway. And um, a rat would then learn via operant conditioning that if it touched a, a lever or a pedal in its room, a slight stimulation, stimulus would be applied to this, this electrode and it would get like a, a reward. Um, how do we know the rat's being rewarded? Well, um, via operant conditioning, the behavior of pressing the pedal increases and the rat may even learn that it will, uh, or may even uh, over time, uh, work to overcome obstacles like electrified grids or other uh, other impediments in order to get its reward. So um, reward pathway is important. You know, you've certainly heard about this, I, I would think, in an in, in, in intro psych class or a class on drugs and alcohol like my class or maybe even a, um, a good class on abnormal psychology. Here's just an image of the uh, mesolimbic dopamine pathway. You can see also the serotonin uh, connections there too. And you can see it works from the uh, kind of the limbic system up into the forebrain. Structures and functions, functions and structures, forebrain areas, especially connections between limbic and frontal areas seem to have a lot to do with emotions. And uh, that's a, a, a bit of a, a vague statement, but I think it kind of gives us enough of a summary for what we're talking about. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Well, gosh, thanks so much. If you made it this far, uh, I'm impressed. You have my respect. I know this is a long lecture. We're clocking in at almost an hour and a half. I'm getting myself a little bit tired, a little bit thirsty. Uh, in the next lecture, I'm going to try and take some of these basic uh, bits of information that I've given you about neuroscience and neuropsychology and connect it to neuropsychological testing. Um, it's not the case that we have tests for every single one of these functions that I've highlighted, but we have tests for many of them. And and um, I think you'll find it interesting and hopefully memorable once we start to connect the structures, the functions, the pathologies, and some of the tests that we can use to identify those all together. Some of that's coming up in my next lecture. In the time between now and then, uh, take a break, you know, have a cup of coffee, have a cookie, <laughs> replenish yourself. And thanks again. Uh, I really appreciate your attention. And I'll be back with another lecture pretty soon. Bye-bye.